Hello, I'm Mary Atwood and I'm really delighted to welcome back Orlando Wood to discuss his new book, Look Out. Um, I first spoke to Orlando in 2019, just before the pandemic had broken out, and Orlando was discussing his book Lemon, how the advertising brain turned sour. And Orlando draws heavily on Ian McGilchrist's work um, in terms of his hemisphere, hemisphere theory and how that's related to not only advertising, but, but culture as a whole. So Orlando is the Chief Innovation Officer at System One, which is an advertising research company. He's an honorary fellow of the Institute of Practitioners in Advertising. Um, and he's also really one of the leading thinkers in the field of advertising and how to create advertising that's not just effective, but memorable, full of humor, and that really re-engages us with what it is that makes us human um, and what that means to be in the world. So welcome Orlando and it's lovely to, to have you back and you're going to do a presentation on your new book, Look Out, which we're looking forward to. Thank you very much, Mary. Lovely to be here. Um, so let me, let me um, see if I can share my screen because I'm keen to chat you through this book, which is called Look Out, which uh, I launched late uh, last year. And... Um, it's a book which follows in the footsteps of Lemon and, of course, which draws on Ian's work and very grateful to Ian for his support. But I should say that, you know, these are my views in this book and my, my uh, research as well. So um, it's my take, I suppose, on the world and drawing on his wonderful hemisphere theory. So I launched a Lemon and was very pleased to come and chat to you about it in 2019. And Lemon was a, uh, a blend, really, of, I suppose, neuroscience, cultural history, but also advertising research to try to explain why advertising was not as effective as it used to be. And since writing Lemon, I've had the pleasure of chatting to a lot of senior marketeers and people in advertising, and they've confided in me that they feel that there is a loss of experience and indeed a loss of confidence uh, around today when it comes to creating the great work that establishes and maintains brands. And this too at a time, in fact, when in this digitally disrupted world, I think culture itself finds itself in something of a bind. And so that's why I wrote this second book, Look Out, again with the Institute of Practitioners in Advertising, and it draws, like Lemon, on cultural history too. And uh, that is really where I'm going to start, because I think there are other periods in history which have much to tell us about the world today. So let's have a look inside its covers. On or about December 1910, human character changed, said Virginia Woolf. Decades of industrial expansion were changing habits of thinking. Innovations such as the motor car, the aeroplane, photography, film, x-ray, were shaping culture in much the same way that technology is shaping our world today. But it's to a period 400 or so years before this that we must look to understand fully some of the changes around us in culture today. And that's to the invention of the printing presses in the 1440s and the Reformation that would follow. The printing presses enabled the publication of the Bible, of course, in many languages across Europe, but it also enabled the publication of the Malleus Maleficarum, a kind of guidebook for spotting and trying witches. Enabled, too, the publication of tales of monstrous birds and wondrous signs and tales of the apocalypse. Fake news is nothing new. So these industrial and technological advances had a profound effect on the human psyche. 
the late 19th century and early 20th centuries, we see people moving to the towns and cities, a sense that community is being lost and a rising tide of anxiety and mental illness too. Europe was starting to turn inwards. And if we look back to 1500, we see that the professions in particular in the towns and cities where the books were made and published and read started to block themselves off in their box pews to look downwards and inwards at their Bibles and primers. And a new kind of solemnity started to take hold. So if you were living in around 1500, this would have felt very much like the last of days. And if you were living in around 1900, there would have been a profound sense of disorientation, of malaise. I think it's interesting to look at the art of these two periods to try to understand what might have been going on. In around 1500, Dürer paints the painting on the left here. This was a time, as Ian points out, when mirrors were starting to become more widely available and people were starting to paint themselves for the first time. Here we see Dürer's self-portrait. It would have seemed rather blasphemous, this painting at the time, with the curling ringlets and the beard suggesting an image of Christ, but it's not so much that that interests me. It's something else. It's that fixed gaze or the stare. Now, the stare is quite different from a look. The look is grounded in the body. It's voluntary. It changes in its intensity. It respects its subject. The stare is quite different. The stare is analytic. It seeks to reduce its subject, to break it down, to penetrate it in some way. And as Ian points out, the stare is also a sign of terrified helplessness. We see the stare in the work of the avant-garde artists too, 1905 or thereabouts onwards. Here is a, a painting on the right by Malevich of himself, again, that very intense stare. As I said, this was a period when uh, there was a rise in, in mental illness, and the stare is also a feature of certain kinds of mental illness. So the stare, as Ian says, is not known for its ability for building bridges with people. And when you see it start to emerge in culture, I believe that it signals a few other things, a sense of detachment, a sense of, I guess, a loss of human vitality in culture, and that an adversarial stance is starting to take hold and a desire to shock and mock. You see it 15 or so years before the Reformation, and you see it start to emerge five to 10 years before the Great War. Of course, the pandemic, the detachment of the 1920s that allowed ideology to take hold and everything that followed thereafter. Well, I'm afraid to say that I think we're seeing the stare emerge again in art, in culture, but also too, sadly, in advertising. It's as if a stare that coerces is starting to replace the look that caresses. A kind of rigidity has crept into culture that is visible on the human face. Just one of many features that I think have beset advertising over the last 15 years or so, and that are undermining its effectiveness. Because we too have experienced a kind of technological disruption of the public sphere. Look at these photographs by Eric Pickersgill. They look unremarkable at first until you realize that the photographer has removed the mobile devices that these people are looking at. And what's left is a kind of silhouette of humanity, people looking downwards and inwards. The internet, for all its wonderful things, has made us very goal-orientated. Its algorithms have pushed people to the extremes and it has narrowed our attention so that even when we're with people, we're not exactly present. To understand attention, I turn, of course, to Ian's work. Ian, as we all know, is perhaps one of the world's experts on brain lateralization and the way in which the two hemispheres of the brain pay attention to the world. Not that the two hemispheres do different things, he says, 
but that they do things differently. And the left hemisphere, my version of his hemisphere theory, I suppose, he suggests that uh, he suggests that there is this narrow kind of attention, narrow beam attention that the left hemisphere brings to bear on things. He talks about its goal orientation, its desire to abstract things from their context, break things down into smaller parts, to categorize things, perhaps even people. And it's very explicit, he says, uh, with its uh, inability to see or appreciate ambiguity and its, and its lack of, uh, it can't cope very well with uncertainty either very linear in its uh, thinking in terms of cause and effect, likes things to be repeatable, uh, familiar, it's very literal, very factual, can't bear uh, uh, any sort of ambiguity. So uh, the kind of grey areas that perhaps the right hemisphere can cope with, it really can't deal with things are right or wrong, good or bad. And it's rather self-absorbed and dogmatic with an overly optimistic sense of the world. He also talks about its desire uh, oh, it's understanding uh, of uh, things and tools, tools with which to manipulate the world, language, signs and symbols, perhaps being chief of these, and its an inability to understand music, only very basic sort of rhythm. Now, it's the right hemisphere that, of course, he describes as presenting the world to us in the first place with its broad and vigilant attention, understanding of context, the whole. If the left brain understands things, the right brain understands people, their gestures, their intonation, their expression, their movement, all of the things that wrap around the words, if you like, the implicit. And it understands the whole world, in fact, as a set of connections and relationships. It's open to novelty and contradiction, which means that it can well believe that two opposing thoughts could both be true at the same time, which means it understands metaphor and it understands humour too. It's the right hemisphere that tells the difference between a joke and a lie. And it's very self-aware and questioning of its time and place in the world. And it's what gives us our sense of lived time, space and depth and helps us to appreciate music the individual voices as well as the whole, all unfolding in lived time. Now, as Ian suggests, the two hemispheres are joined in the middle by the corpus callosum, and these fibers in the cutaway here, they bridge the two brains, but it seems that their main effect, uh, its main purpose is to inhibit one brain or the other at any given time. And the left hemisphere has a greater inhibitory effect on the right than the right does on the left. And so in certain people and at certain times in history, we start to occupy the left hemisphere perhaps more than we should. And habits of thinking start to emerge that are very consistent with its preferences. And I suspect we are in exactly one of those times at the moment. Ian talks about the different types of attention and uses this figure to try to explain it. Chances are the first time you see this, you see it as H4 rather than the E's and the eights. And that's because the right hemisphere he describes brings this kind of broad beam attention to bear on the world, giving us our sense of alertness and sustained attention, which grounds us in the world and the people in it. And also a sense of vigilance for things that are just at the edge of our awareness, as he puts it, or just slightly off stage, helps us too with divided attention. And anything of interest, it seems, is passed to the left hemisphere for this sort of narrow beam attention to be brought to bear, the E's and the eights in his example. Now, I believe that as we've been spending more and more time looking at our devices close up and in this increasingly technological world, it's engineered with its engineering focus, I think we have been losing this broad beam attention, our connection with the wider world. And we're starting to see habits of the left hemisphere come to the fore. Rather antisocial habits, you might say. This sense of detachment, a loss of human vitality, and this adversarial stance. Also a kind of fearfulness. As I was writing this book, I went for a walk one day. And I came across a woman coming the other way, walking her dog. And the dog suddenly jumped up at me. Uh, started barking at me rather viciously and the woman had to sort of restrain the dog and said, she said, I'm so sorry about that. He's normally fine. It's the cone. The dog was wearing one of those veterinary cones round its neck, which of course narrow 
its attention. And when dogs wear those cones, they can start to become rather fearful and aggressive. And I think that's what's happened to us too in the last five or 10 years. Certainly when you look at Google search trends for terms like anxiety and humor, you see this inc incredible increase in anxiety, interest in anxiety. And at the same time, this loss of humor, people not looking for things that are funny anymore. That's a real concern for me because I think that humor keeps society flexible by poking fun at rigidity, perhaps poking fun at the rigidity of the left hemisphere. When it goes, we know that there is something really wrong. You see this too in the decline in the number of romance and comedy films that are being made today. What happens when we lose this human vitality? Well, of course, the left hemisphere uh, likes to shock us into feeling, as Ian might put it. We see the rise of the horror and the thriller at the same time. This is the context within which advertising is being made today, and we see a loss of humor in advertising too. System One, the company I work for, we measure emotional response to advertising, the ability of advertising to connect with audiences. And what we find in the last 10 years and the work we've tested for our clients is that people just don't find advertising as funny as they, as they used to. And what we also see is this sort of um, stare among very many other features starting to emerge. So what is to be done? How can we broaden our attention? How can we move from the darkness to the light? Well, I think and suspect there are things that each of us could probably do in our own lives, but I think that advertising can play a role too, because these two types of attention, broad beam attention and narrow beam attention, have a bearing on the kind of advertising that we make, but also the kinds of business effects you might expect to see as a result, the effectiveness of advertising. I'm going to just pause for a couple of other observations, of Ian's actually, which I think give us a clue as to the kind of advertising that might capture the broad beam attention of the right hemisphere. And there that the right hemisphere is better connected to the limbic system, which helps us to experience emotion. It's also more associated with episodic memory, memory of people, events, places, episodes, if you like, in our lives. Whereas the left hemisphere is more associated with semantic memory. That's the memory of facts and figures in the public domain. So I'm going to show you an ad now, which I think uh, was created to capture this broad beam attention. It's an old ad, but let's have a look at it now. I walked about a bit on my own. Oh no. I strolled around without anyone else. Oh dear, oh dear. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high or vales and hills. Only Heineken can do this because it refreshes the poets other beers cannot reach. Now you can see there the broad vistas. This is William Wordsworth reimagined from the Heineken Refreshes the Parts campaign. But the broad vistas, the uh, music, the sounds of the bird song, the connection with the wider world, the intonation, the characterization in the voice, the metaphor, and indeed the humor. Now I'm going to show you an ad which I think is created for this narrow beam attention. Let's have a look. Introducing Budweiser Zero. Zero percent alcohol, zero grams of sugar, full Budweiser flavor. A refreshing alcohol-free brew that tastes like the real thing. Budweiser Zero, zero compromise. You'll notice there just how close up we are to everything. It's the E's and the eights here in Ian's example. So here too, we see that everything's dislocated from time and place, short mechanistic uh, cuts, no sense of lived time, highly rhythmic, uh, very intense. 
And so when you look at these two ads, I think you have advertising on the right here, which assumes no inherent interest in the brand or product that seeks to create interest in the brand and advertising on the left here that assumes already that there's some kind of interest in the brand and simply tries to nudge us towards a purchase. And it's towards this kind of advertising on the left that we've been gradually drifting over the last 15 years or so, as I've shown in both my books. So what can we learn about the right hemisphere, perhaps, that might help us capture the broad beam attention of audiences, perhaps create more interesting, entertaining, enjoyable, and inviting advertising? Well, I think, and I draw on Ian heavily here, that it all starts with an understanding and an appreciation of the living, of human uniqueness. If we look at these drawings by Watto, drawn perhaps 300 or so years ago, I think they reveal something very interesting. And that's the, the, the kind of soul, really, of this boy. Look at the light on the face, the way they capture a boy in movement, the eyes, the mouth. Look, too, at Watto's hands here, the left hand of Watto he's drawing here. And each one of them really suggests something of a conversation that might be going on that we could probably understand and fill in the gaps for ourselves. As Roger Scruton puts it, the eyes, the mouth, the hands, these are the features by which the soul of another makes itself known to us. And they're very interesting for the right hemisphere, as I think Ian has suggested. Let's look at this painting now by Vermeer. In this painting, a girl sits with the soldier and something ha happens when you get two people together like this. I think it's what Ian might describe as a sense of betweenness. I think it's interesting the way that her left hand, con connected of course to the right hemisphere, the exploratory right hemisphere is open uh, on the table. And the right hands of these characters are more tucked away, controlled, controlled by the left grasping hemisphere, of course. Look at the light on her face and the sense that it suggests something is happening. There's some sort of complicit uh, conversation going on here. We don't know exactly what it is, but it suggests that we have to fill in the gaps really and that's what great advertising does it helps it leaves the audience to fill in the gaps without telling them exactly what to think and feel i'm going to show you an ad now and i'd like you to have half an eye on the painting on the left because it has these features of human uniqueness and human betweenness very much at its heart it's a it's an old ad but let's have a look at it now Very successful ad for the Crocker Bank in 1970 and that music was actually written for that ad by Paul Williams later popularized by the Carpenters but in it you'll have noticed the facial expressions the blinking eyes the human touch and of course that music all amplifies as Ian puts it our ability to feel so we talked about human uniqueness human movement I think um, uh, well, human movement is the, is the next thing uh, I'd like to talk to you about. And um, it seems odd to show a statue, a marble statue, uh, to demonstrate this, but have a look at it for a moment. Look at the way Benini has captured movement in this body, in the muscles, in the face, as David prepares to cast his sling. I think human movement's very important because it signifies that something of interest is, and importance is about to happen, but it also, of course, captures our attention. 
I'm going to show you an ad now. Again, have half an eye on the statue on the left. Because I think it, this ad uses movement to draw us into the space, but also to um, tell us that something of significance is about to happen. Let's have a look. Morning, all. Morning. Morning. Brothers, sisters, today a great legacy rests upon your shoulders. Because here, we make more than just tea. We make proper brews. Brews that bring a tear to your eye and warmth to your soul. So go out there and do it for each other. Do it for yourselves, but most of all, do it for Yorkshire! Oh, and the fire drill's Thursday at three. Yorkshire tea, where everything's done proper. Sean Bean playing the part he's known for there. But the movement uh, draws us in, and the lovely reaction shots on the faces, of course. So human movement, as well as human uniqueness and human betweenness. And I think there's something else, and that's that when you've got your characters, you really need something to happen. A bit like in that last example, in incident, I talk about the importance of character, incident and place for the right hemisphere. And so uh, in this painting on the left by Rembrandt, I think you see something of that too. You have God in the top right hand corner telling Belshazzar that he shouldn't really be using the gold from the temple for his feast. And look at the reaction in the bodies and the eyes and the faces of those around. Well, in this next example, I think you have a similar kind of divine intervention in advertising too. And it holds our attention. Let's have a look. Hold tight. Text meant for Danny. Sent to Daddy. Relax. I'm your Tanguru. Just blame it on autocorrect. I meant quiche. I fancy quiche. Like aubergine. We should have an aubergine quiche for dinner tonight. Oh. I love, I love quiche. Time to tango. I love it. The Tanguru coming to Amelia's aid, as uh, she often does. These repeated characters, by the way, very effective in advertising and have been disappearing at the same time. So when it comes to the, the types of features that might capture and hold attention, this is really my focus for this book, Look Out. And I look at a number of features that you might associate in advertising with the preferences of the left hemisphere's habits of thinking. I look at flatness and abstraction, that very close up kind of way of looking at things, just the hands or the mouth or bits of the product you often see in advertising today. And then this sort of unilateral communication, words on the screen, voiceover, monologue telling us what to do. Adjectives used as nouns, left brain likes things after all, so things like small just works would be a good example of that. Freeze frame effects, audio repetition, rhythmic soundtracks, these are things you know, where the left hemisphere tries to break things down, atomize time into short, sharp moments. I also look for facial frontality, uh, that stare, self-consciousness um, associated, I think, with the left hemisphere, the sort of empty smile that often goes with uh, the left hemisphere, product centricity, split screen effects. These are all things that I think you might see in advertising and associate with the left brain. And for the right hemisphere, I look at these sorts of features in advertising. You might summarize them as character, incident and place, but a very clear sense of place, a scene unfolding with progression, characters that interact with each other, that sense of betweenness, unspoken communication, as well as dialogue accents, subversion of language, things set in the past, perhaps reference to other cultural works, music with melody, and those wonderful uh, spontaneous changes in facial expression we've seen some examples of and something happening that's out of the ordinary, animals, animated characters, people touching. I think these are things that we might broadly say in advertising might appeal to the right hemisphere of the brain, knowing uh, a little bit about it from Ian's work. And I teamed up with a, an advertising measurement company who looked at the attention given to advertising as it plays out in, in people's living rooms uh, on their TV screens. We looked at about 200 ads and we looked at their emotional response as well. And we looked at the features that these ads had and we found that it was features associated with the right hemisphere, the living, animals, characters, dialogue, 
this change in facial expression, people touching, music, something emerging from the scene, a real place, something perhaps slightly out of the ordinary. These are the things that elicit an emotional response and that capture attention. And these left brain features tend to push people away. They cause people to detach, above all, that stare, that facial frontality. So you might think, well, perhaps this has a bearing too for advertisers on advertising's ability to create uh, business effects, to be successful, to connect with audiences, and you'd be right. I worked to show this with effectiveness data and showed that it was these right brain campaigns that created the biggest number of uh, business effects that were most likely to translate into market share gain and profit gain. And that's because they establish things in memory. They establish the brand in memory. They help to leap to, they help to make it leap to mind before any other. And they also establish trust too. So you might think, well, perhaps uh, then we need to be creating more advertising a bit like this. And I would totally agree with you. And uh, what I'd like to do is to sort of close with a, an ad, really. And, so not, and again, it's an old ad. And uh, the, there's a great advertising thinker called Paul Feldwick who says that advertising really ultimately is a bit like putting on a show. And in this next ad i'd like you to think about that and hold uh, look out for something actually and that's to look at the eyes uh, because i think in this ad the eyes look at the way that they command the stage of the show but also how they connect the players on that stage and how that invites us in let's have a look at it This was advertising that sold a lot of jeans, a lot of music and a lot of boxer shorts too. And so I often conclude that perhaps the focused attention of the brain's left hemisphere oughtn't be your focus of attention as a marketeer. We need instead to broaden our attention, to look up and to look out. Because people look away from advertising that looks inwards. We need instead to create the spectacle that lifts the eyes, opens the minds and warms the hearts of those we wish to persuade. How do we do that? Well, there are a few ideas in these books and I suspect in Ian's too. And now is the time to do it because now more than ever we need advertising with wit and charm, advertising with human vitality, advertising that entertains. And in a world full of fear, anxiety, and detachment, what could be more wonderful than that? Thank you, Mary. I hope everyone enjoyed that, aspects of it at least. Oh, it was wonderful. Thank you very much, Orlando. I and mean, I've got some questions. Um, wonderful. First, first of all, what has the reception been like to this? Uh, you know, going into um, a place where, uh, and speaking to advertisers, 
where perhaps they've been more focused on the idea that in order to, to, to grab people's attention, you have to create something which is new, innovative, edgy, different, um, and generally it's always about forwards movements. Um, you're looking back in essence exactly. and finding the gems really, you know, the, the excellence that was in the past. And yep. so have you, has that worked is one question also what, so what has the reception been towards well, that? Thank you for asking. I mean, I think, um, pe people seem very touched and receptive actually. And, and see, see, I think recognize the, the truth in it. Mm. And yes, I do look back and you know we've 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 often discussed this haven't we Mary that you know sometimes when culture I think finds itself stuck in a bit of a rut you have to look backwards to to find the energy and the movement to to propel you forwards again mm. and I think that's uh you know without Titian, Mantegna, Veronese there'd be no Rembrandt you know without Cicero there'd probably be no Shakespeare so you know you do have to look back um, for creative inspiration sometimes and uh, it's it you know because I've been collecting the effectiveness evidence as well you know I think there is a real case for um, charming advertising you know advertising with humor and, and that, that entertains us and that and that that is what I hope people will draw from it and that it might help to elevate culture once again rather than brutalize it and that's my you know, that's my hope. Yes, I mean, it's, it's all, it's quite opposite um, in some ways, isn't it? As opposed to, to the way perhaps we're guided to think today, um, yeah. um, especially about uh, eradicating the past or, uh, but both personally and culturally. Um, but, you know, as, as you've said before, and we have discussed this ourselves, that looking back is not about living in the past, but it's about taking something which was, was brilliant, finding the best parts of that, the gold, if you like, from the past and bringing those into yes. um, a modern context. So they will look different. For instance, the tango ad mm -hmm. that you showed, which was very funny, very humorous, but, but there were elements in that particular advert which looked so similar to the Rembrandt painting that you had next to it, yeah. even in the characterization of the face, isn't it? Yeah, yes, yeah, she liked, um, looked like that, 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 the woman in the Rembrandt painting. Yes, yeah, she really did. <laughs> yes. yes, yeah, absolutely. So, well, these are things that, you know, have, have always touched people through, through, the, through the years. I mean, you know, Ian's work shows, I think, beautifully describes, you know, what it is that, that is important in the world. It's, you know, human connection, our place, our connection with the wider world um, and this broad beam attention and and you know I think we've we've become in this technological world very narrow beam mm. and that causes problems for society for culture we need to sort of reconnect again with each other and the world and uh, easier said than done but you know it, it, you've got to start somewhere and I think I think Ian's work really points the way. Mm. I and mean, do you feel as well that with the digital age as it is, and we now have so many more advertisements, images on our screens and on, on the many screens, additional screens that we now have in terms of mobile phones, iPads, mm -hmm. computers, you know, we don't just have a television anymore, or some people don't even have a television. Mm -hmm. But um, so how, did, how does taking an approach that worked in the 70s stand uh, amongst a kind of greater field of where it's sort of not fighting it with the digital um, elements that are out there, but, but how does, how can it stand up within that context? And do you think in a way it's a good thing that it is different because it will stand out? Because well, exactly, exactly that. Uh, John Hegarty, so John Hegarty, the great advertising uh, creative says, you know, when everyone else seeks need to zag. Um, and there is a, um, you know, there is a, uh, uh, I think in my in my research, you know, I show how this kind of work today is more effective than that very uh, left-brained, mechanistic, you know, um, advertising, which you know is is quite quite tiring to look at and quite 
I, I find it quite stressful because it's so very close up. Mm. Um, and it's close up, most likely, you know, in part, because we're looking at things close up and, and the size of a postage stamp a lot of the time. Mm. You know, so um, we, we're zoomed in on things. If you, th if you think about, I think, what happens in a technological revolution, the people who are masters of that technology tend to rise to the top. And so a certain style of thinking then starts to pervade everything. And that style of thinking is geared towards the left hemisphere, its engineering mindset, its inability to see metaphor and appreciate humor, you know, and then you get this sort of swing, you know, towards the left hemisphere's preferences in culture more broadly. And I think that's what's been happening. So, you know, as I, uh, I did a couple of, couple of things in this presentation, but in the books I do more to show how this, um, you know, you can see this more broadly in culture, not just in, advertising mm. but you can see it in music we hear it in music you can see it in um, the types of television programs that are made you you can even see it i think in car colors you know yes. the way that no, tell us colors. about that yeah i think that's a very interesting piece of your research and that's in the book isn't it it's in the book you know yeah. um, it's a, if if in the reformation we painted churches white you know i quit there's a Hint, you know. Which is a non-colour. Um, this is car colours over the years, um, going back to uh, 1990, so from about 2000 onwards, you get this rise in the grey and the black and the white. White is now the most popular car colour. You know, green, which Ian talks about as being associated, more associated with the right hemisphere, disappeared, you know. Um, so it, interesting, isn't it? You know, but it is. Culturally, there's a sort of deadening and flattening and mattening, you know, to to, to all things in marketing. It seems to me. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, how do we get the depth back again that, that between us? Yes, and behind it, there's there's a fear element, probably. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't there? There's a sort yeah. of underlying fear, or you know, talking about car colours, but also people's homes. Um, tend to lack individuality yes. sometimes and they're scared to put a colour on the wall and everything becomes very whitewashed. Well, know, look at any uh, sort of coffee shop really or, or, you know, cafe and you'll probably find the walls have been stripped back, you know, perhaps to the brickwork. Um, everything looks a bit industrial. Um, you know, this sort of started to happen probably around 2000 as well. Mm. And, you know, there's, there's where's the joy gone? Where's the... Um, you know, uh, where is where is the colour gone? Mm. Um, so the feeling, is, I mean, it's connected with emotion, isn't it, as well, colour? You know, yes, very, very much yes, so. Well, in fact, that's one of the things I look at in the book. I look at different colour uh, ways of treating advertising, you know, in post-production, because there seems to be, to my mind anyway, um, a, a preference for sort of teal, grey and orange type filters that make everything look a bit washed out, a bit monochrome, quite stark. And so I, I, I show how the same, the same ad when treated this way, but then treated with the, my brief to the colorist was, you know, um, I want something romantic here with vividness of color and warmth of color. And he also introduced some diffusion and grain effects, uh, which make it feel like real film as opposed to the digital look that you know tends to flatten things and uh and we 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 tested these two things for emotional response and the, the version with the vividness of color and the warmth and the diffusion and the grain you know, it was people talking about their lives the older people talking about their lives uh, was so much more engaging than the than the flat cold version and uh in fact it wasn't just that they felt better about it but in the, what they said about the advertising was interesting too. For the, for, the, for the warm, romantic version, people talked about nostalgia and the past and uh, poetry and, you know, life and uh, wonderful things, you know, associations that you might want with your brand. In the cold version, and I kid you not, someone said, um, I'm not interested in old people. So it just, you know, colour is a metaphor, I think, for, for like music, actually. You know, it's a sort of vehicle to, um, to help feel, to help yes. by feeling. And when the world is full of images which are monochromatic and a bit 
grey. You know, I think that all of this has a bearing on how people feel and mm. seeps into you after a while, you know, and I think really? we need to, what I'm trying to do is show, I suppose, that, you know, right brain work is more effective and actually we should be doing more of it and enriching culture with, our, with what we do. Yes, um, absolutely. Do you, so if somebody purchases Look Out, um, the book, what, what is in the book that um, is, would you say, apart from you're looking at the stare and this sort of adversarial mm -hmm. stance, um, what, what else is in Look Out that's different, makes it different from Lemon? Well, look, I go into detail and I draw, of course, on Ian's work and quite heavily, and I'm very grateful to Ian for his support on this. Uh, but I talk about those two periods in history in some detail, and I go into more detail on what I see as being detachment in those periods, evidence in art of the loss of human vitality, um, and uh, also this adversarial stance and a desire to shock and mock, mm. drawing on you know the, the, the history from those periods and the art of those periods. Um, and I show how, how things change over time. You know, I want to, for example, uh, this, is, this, is how, um, this is how Cranach's paintings change from the, from the sort of movement and, and, and flow, you know, the, the, air, the, the sort of wind blowing through the clouds and Christ's loincloth and, and the connection between the characters here towards a gradually more austere, symmetrical, barren landscape sort of uh, thing. And, and unreal. It, look, it yeah. looks almost like a sort of, the characters look yeah. like caricatures and the place yeah, looks right. completely like a no place when it looks like somewhere in outer space on right. the moon. That's right. The, landscape. The, the words on the, on the screen, as it were, the words on the canvas taking priority, a bit like advertising today. And the stare of the horse, you know, right dead centre staring out at us. Um, you know, and, and actually what I do is I show, there's, a, there's an ad um, came out last year. Isn't that rather similar? The barren landscapes, the darkened skies, Uncanny. symmetry, the horse that stares, even the crucifixes, the introspection, the inwardness. Mm. Very much like that. Um, and also, you know, I mean, I, I talk about Art. I connect the art with, with work today, with advertising today. So I talk about that. I, I mean, there's a lot of uh, talk about advertising, of course, and what makes for effective advertising. And in the final chapter, I just talk through, um, you know, what I think is needed. I talk about uh, uniqueness, transience, and the eternal human vitality. Some of the images that I was just showing you, um, uh, human betweenness, as Ian would put it. Yeah. And uh, human movement, humour, what humour is, I draw on Henri Bergson's um, a description of humour and what it is, and mm. talks about it poking fun at rigidity. Um, and I, I sort of can't help feeling whether it isn't the right hemisphere poking fun at the left hemisphere's rigidity and keeping it in check. And, you know, when it, when it disappears, you know, we're, we're, kind of, we're kind of in trouble, really. So I talk about character, I look at animators of the past and how they, um, you know, what we can learn from them in, in bringing to life uh, people. I talk about music, colour, um, and uh, yes, and, and end on a note, I hope, of optimism that we might, um, we yes. might turn things around. Well, I think it, it does have a very opt optimistic and hopeful um, message as well. And I think psychologically, what it's very interesting what you draw on here because that sense of turning inwards and um, overly being overly self-analytical, overly self-reflective, you end up in a in a sort of prison of your own mm -hmm. self, yeah. your own psyche. Of mirrors, as Ian might put it, you know. We're very much in that space at the moment. Um, uh, and in and in a sense, that's encouraged by um, looking at the individual person's psyche um, and mind without situating oneself in a greater scheme of things. So, being at looking out reconnects you, re-engages you yes. with the world, doesn't it? Yes. And so that, I that, think the psychological benefits are, um, are, are extraordinary. It's very very important, isn't it? I mean, I think. Um, 
you know, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a, a, a psychiatrist, so I, I can't speak with the utmost authority on this, but um, those people with, um, you know, who, who are suffering with depression and uh, tend, you know, tend to find difficult to, to look out, you know, and uh, I mean, they often have a, a greater sense of, <laughs> a probably more realistic sense of the world, Ian puts it. Um, but, but, you know, th there is this sort of, you do have to look out and you, ha you have to sort of connect with other people um, and be in the world to, to, to do it. And I think that's one of the problems with the pandemic is that, you know, in our, in our isolation, it's probably exacerbated some of the things that were already there mm. and that we were already, you know, looking down and in a bit. And, you know, it's cut a lot of people off from each other, deprived us of many of the things that the right brain, um, you know, appreciates, loves, you know, connection, spontaneity, um, uh, the, the sort of being in a time and place, you know, with other people. Uh, and I think it's causing all sorts of all sorts of problems. Who knows, you know, where it will go? But um, hope we all uh, you know, sort ourselves out. But yeah, I think it's uh, it, we need to look out. And of course, the, the title of the book, "Look Out," has two senses. Um, both we need to look out, but we need to look out. Very good. Thank you, Orlando. Thank you very much for for sharing your work with us today. And um, where can people buy the book? Oh, well, it's on Amazon. Amazon. Um, yes. And uh, so have a look there if you're interested. Um, it's also available through the IPA, but I su suggest you try Amazon in the first place. But Wonderful. Thank you for having me, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.